Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. I will start with the usual update on the most recent COVID statistics for Scotland. Uh, I can confirm that an additional 43 positive cases were confirmed yesterday. That represents 0.9% of people who were newly tested yesterday, and it takes the total number of cases now to 18,890. A full health board breakdown will be available later, uh, but the provisional information I have is that 27 of the 43 cases are in the Grampian Health Board area. It's not yet clear how many are connected to the ongoing outbreak in Aberdeen, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about the situation there shortly. A further five cases appear to be in the Greater Glasgow and Clyde area, which is a reduction in the numbers that we've seen there in recent days. A total of 262 patients are currently in hospital uh, with confirmed COVID, which is eight fewer than yesterday. And a total of four people are in intensive care uh, with confirmed COVID, which is the same number as yesterday. I'm also pleased to say that in the past 24 hours yet, again, no deaths were registered of patients who had tested positive for COVID over the previous 28 days. And therefore, uh, the number of deaths under that measurement remains 2,491. Obviously, the total number of deaths is still a sharp reminder of the dreadful impact of this virus, and my condolences uh, once again go to everyone who has suffered loss. As always, I also want to thank everyone uh, working hard across the country to help us through this pandemic. Uh, the main points I want to cover today are, of course, the outbreak in Aberdeen, uh, but I also want to say something about further measures that we are going to take to try to reduce the risk of transmission. The Economy Secretary will then say a few words about business support and the Chief Medical Officer will give an update on this year's seasonal flu vaccination programme. Flu vaccination is always important, but this winter in particular, as we face uh, the risk of flu together with the risk of COVID, it is even more important. Before all of that, though, I want to draw your attention to an important announcement made last night. The Scottish Government has taken the decision to add three additional countries to the list of those that are subject to quarantine restrictions. Those countries are Belgium, Andorra and the Bahamas. Each of these countries has seen a significant rise in COVID cases over recent days. So from tomorrow, people travelling uh, to Scotland from those countries must self-isolate for 14 days. This is another reminder of how quickly the international situation can change and it's why I would once again remind everyone to think very carefully about booking non-essential foreign travel. Let me return now to the situation that we're dealing with in Aberdeen. I can confirm that as of now a total of 101 cases have been confirmed as part of that cluster. That's an increase of 22 on the position we reported yesterday. And a total of 313 close contacts have now been identified and are being followed up. Although, of course, we expect those numbers still to rise further. It was also confirmed yesterday that two players from Aberdeen Football Club are amongst those who have tested positive. In addition, a further six players have been identified as having been in close proximity with one of those individuals and they are all therefore self-isolating. It is now clear that all eight of these players visited a bar in Aberdeen on Saturday night. In doing so, they blatantly broke the rules that had been agreed between the SFA, the SPFL and the Scottish Government, which, to put it mildly, is completely unacceptable. Uh, this morning, the Scottish Government convened a meeting with the SFA and the SPFL, and following those discussions, the football authorities have confirmed that the game between Aberdeen and St Johnson, scheduled for tomorrow in Perth, will not now go ahead. I think that is the right decision. We are expecting members of the public to behave in a highly precautionary manner right now. And when a football club ends up with players infected with COVID, and let's remember, uh, this is not through bad luck, but through clear breaches of the rules. We cannot take even a small risk that they then spread the infection to other parts of the country. The Scottish Government will also be contacting all club captains and managers to emphasise the importance of complying with the guidance. But let me take the opportunity to emphasise the importance of that directly now. Football has been given the go-ahead on the strict condition that clubs and players abide by the guidance that has been agreed. If they don't do that, they put at risk the return of the professional game. So I welcome Aberdeen's statement that they have reminded players of their obligations. That's important, 
footballers, as we all know, are role models and they should behave accordingly. But it's also important to remind the club and indeed all clubs of the obligation they have to ensure that their players are behaving responsibly and in line with the guidance. Now, to say that this incident is deeply regrettable is an understatement, but it also underlines an extremely important point. Any time one of us fails to abide by the rules, we put others at risk and we give this virus the chance to come roaring back again. That's something we can't afford to do. We've seen every day of this pandemic so far how easily COVID spreads. So we do need to do everything we can to stop it in its tracks. That's why we've taken such strong action in Aberdeen. Uh, the new restrictions are designed to minimise the risk of transmission as we get to the bottom of this incident and make sure it's under control. Uh, these measures are tough, but they are necessary, especially at a time when schools are about to return. So I want to take the opportunity to thank the people of Aberdeen for your understanding and for doing the right thing. It is hugely appreciated. <clears throat> the situation in Aberdeen is extremely challenging and our focus is on getting it under control. But at the same time, we want to learn the lessons of this outbreak uh, and apply those elsewhere. Uh, we've seen similar outbreaks in countries around the world, and it's clear that a common factor in many of them is a link to hospitality. We've always known that settings like pubs and restaurants are particularly susceptible to the spread of the virus. That's why we held back the reopening of hospitality until a later phase, and it's why we staggered its reopening with outdoor venues opening first. We've also got clear guidance uh, for the sector and how it can operate safely. Uh, that includes guidance on things like physical distancing, cleaning and hygiene, and the collection of customer details. Now, it's very clear that many, many businesses, I uh, think the majority, have complied strictly with these kinds of measures, and I'm very grateful to them for that. But it's also clear that there are some businesses where that has not been the case. Uh, the government is determined to do everything we can to prevent further outbreaks and we want to also ensure that our hospitality sector can continue to remain open. That's why today I'm announcing two uh, further measures. The first is that we now intend to make it mandatory for a range of settings, including hospitality businesses, to collect customer details. That requirement is already in guidance, but it will now be placed on a statutory footing. And it will help to ensure that our test and protect system can function as effectively as possible. Second, we intend to issue new statutory guidance relating to indoor hospitality. Uh, we'll set out more detail uh, of this next week, but the aim is to ensure greater compliance with the key public health measures like physical distancing. And we will work with Police Scotland and local environmental health teams to uh, explain these measures and, if necessary, enforce compliance. Both these changes will take effect from next Friday and they will help to clarify exactly what is required from hospitality. But I want to emphasise that businesses should already be doing these things, so if you're not, don't wait till next week, start complying now. Uh, premises should be collecting and keeping contact details. Uh, wherever possible, people should be asked to pre-book tables in advance and there should be no queuing. Uh, people should be seated only with table service. Uh, customers should not be standing together to watch football, dancing or queuing at the bar. Uh, and there should be no queuing outside either. Uh, and in any circumstances where it is unavoidable for any reason, those in queues should be physically distanced. Uh, we're also asking that there is no background music or volume from televisions. It is really important in terms of minimising the risk of transmitting this virus that people are not having to shout over each other or lean in uh, in order to be heard. Our hospitality businesses obviously have a vital role to play in making premises safe. Uh, but as I said yesterday, we are all the first line of defence against this virus. So I know the kind of measures I've just outlined there seem really restrictive, and they are really restrictive. But I want to emphasise again that they are uh, there and will be put there because they are necessary. We see in Aberdeen right now, including the situation with the football club, how quickly this virus spreads. Uh, so everybody, please think about your own actions. No more than three households should be meeting together in uh, places like bars and restaurants at any one time. People from different households should be staying physically distant from each other. Final update I want to cover today concerns the use of face coverings. 
Um, at the moment, the use of face coverings is mandatory in shops and on public transport, and we are very satisfied that the vast majority of people are complying with those requirements, and I want to thank the public for that. When it comes to other enclosed spaces, we currently advise face coverings, uh, but haven't yet made it mandatory. But as we come further out of lockdown, the risks are heightened. More people are out and about, more places have reopened and more people are gathering together. So as a precautionary measure, I'm announcing today that we are expanding the range of indoor premises where people must wear a face covering. From tomorrow, that list will include venues like uh, libraries, museums, places of worship, uh, and you'll be able to find more detail on exactly what kinds of premises are covered on the Scottish Government website. I can also uh, confirm today that we are updating our guidance on face visors. Uh, based on the latest scientific evidence, we are not convinced that a face visor on its own provides sufficient protection to the wearer or to others. So again, from tomorrow, if a visor is worn, it must be accompanied by another type of face covering. These changes will help to reduce some of the risks that people face, and they are not any of them being made lightly. Uh, and they will help to reduce the risk in enclosed spaces in particular. But it's important to remember that face coverings uh, are just one additional form of protection. We still must observe all of the other public health guidelines. So to close today, as usual, I want to remind you again of facts, uh, the five rules that we all must follow to stay safe. Face coverings in enclosed spaces, avoid crowded places, uh, not just indoors but outdoors as well, clean your hands and hard surfaces regularly, two metres distancing remains the overall rule, um, and self-isolate and book a test if you have symptoms. If we all comply with these five golden rules, then we reduce the risk of this virus spreading and taking hold of us again. So my thanks to everybody who is complying and as always, my encouragement to those uh, who may uh, need to take greater care in doing so. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I'll hand over now to uh, the Economy Secretary to say a few words before uh, the Chief Medical Officer will round off our initial presentations. Thank you, First Minister. I want to start today by touching briefly on the situation in Aberdeen. While I know how devastating the lockdown will be for hospitality businesses that have only just reopened, our priority remains public health and eliminating the virus. For now, let me commend the response from the local authority and local business leaders, including the Chamber of Commerce, the Federation of Small Businesses, the hospitality and hotel sector, and the Aberdeen Business Resilience, uh, Resilience partnership who I met uh, on Wednesday with the Chief Medical Officer. They have helped, me, helped ensure that uh, businesses in and around Aberdeen had all the information they needed to comply, providing invaluable advice on local context, including the importance of maintaining hotel capacity for essential offshore workers. We will remain in close contact as we recognise the value of partnership working and timely, effective, business-focused communication. And we will work with them to learn lessons and be ready to enhance our support for business in the event of another lockdown elsewhere in Scotland. This has highlighted a challenge that we may face uh, in future. At present, businesses like hospitality can re-furlough staff in the event of a local lockdown. If the UK government continue with their plans to end furlough, then it will be financially harder for businesses and employees to do what they have done this week and put the greater good and the importance of public health first. We have raised this with the UK government and continue to do so. Earlier this week, we published our responses to the Advisory Group for Economic Recovery and the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board reports. The Advisory Group report spelled out the scale of the challenge facing Scotland's economy, but they also offered some optimism by presenting a blueprint for how we can move forwards. The reports were clear that this is an opportunity to do things differently and crucially to rebuild our economy with well-being and fair work at its heart. At the core of our responses to both reports is a firm commitment to do all that we can to protect jobs, support jobs and create good quality jobs for the future and deliver a green recovery. We will protect jobs by developing and delivering sector-led recovery plans, working with industry leadership groups, trade unions and others, starting with the construction sector. 
We will support skilled jobs through development of a COVID-19 transition training fund, a flexible skills programme supporting people facing redundancy in the most affected sectors and regions. And we will support up to 20,000 young people into jobs by investing at least uh, £50 million in measures to achieve this, with Sandy Begbie leading the work on the Scottish Youth Guarantee in partnership with employers and others. We will also create high quality green jobs, including those created as a result of our £230 million economic recovery stimulus package, of which £66 million has been allocated to the green recovery. This pandemic has really underlined the economic importance of digital capacity and capability. The businesses that have coped best are those that have been digitally capable. That's why I was pleased to announce this morning that we are doubling our support for the Digital Boost Programme, uh, the increasing the capacity of the programme for the remainder of this financial year and enabling us to support even more of Scotland's SMEs to take advantage of technologies to help improve their productivity, increase their resilience and create new market opportunities. I also announced that the Flexible Workforce Development Fund, which helps employers upskill their existing workforce through college courses, will be extended this year and support our response to COVID-19. The fund will be increased from £10 million to £20 million to support businesses to provide upskilling, reskilling and training for their staff. An initial £13 million will be available immediately through colleges who will continue to expand their current work and support for employers. And we will work with businesses and stakeholders to ensure the further £7 million builds on the success of this fund and expands the opportunities for business to engage. We know we're facing the biggest economic challenge of our lifetimes. There is no silver bullet and we are at the very start of our journey. But what we have done in our response to both these reports is focus on the immediate actions we need to take to support Scotland's economy and protect jobs to create a basis for a strong recovery. In the coming weeks and months, we will publish more detailed plans in our programme for government, our infrastructure investment plan and our climate change plan update. And these will provide us with further opportunities to take a range of actions to help support our economic recovery and build a better future for all of Scotland. Thank you. I'll hand over to you. Thank you, First Minister. Each year, the seasonal flu vaccination programme helps to protect the most vulnerable and reduce pressure on the NHS in Scotland. This will be more important than ever this year in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, for this year's vaccination programme, as well as considering those who are most at risk from the seasonal flu, we must also consider who would be most at risk from concurrent infection with both COVID-19 and flu together. So that's why the Scottish Government is expanding free eligibility for the seasonal flu vaccine to social care workers who provide direct care, to household members of individuals who are shielding, and to all those aged 55 and over who are not already eligible. And we will then look to vaccinate those aged 50 to 54 if vaccine supplies allow. This expansion builds in the protection which is already provided to those most at risk from the seasonal flu. Those who are already eligible to receive the vaccine include those aged 65 and over, those who have an underlying health condition which increases the risk, pregnant women, healthcare workers, young and unpaid carers, children aged between the age of two and five years old, and primary school children. Now, the most effective way to protect against the seasonal flu is to continue to prioritise those who are most at risk, those individuals who are already eligible to receive the seasonal flu vaccine. This flu season, we will aim to vaccinate more people within those groups than ever before, over and above the expansion of free eligibility to the new cohorts I've just described. In total, we are aiming to vaccinate over 2 million people, which is an increase of 800,000 vaccines from last year's programme. NHS Scotland's health boards will be delivering this expansion and will be taking a phased approach. Now, this allows the health boards to begin vaccination for different groups as soon as the necessary supply of vaccine becomes available, whilst prioritising those most at risk. The first phase will begin in October, as planned, and will include those who are, who are already eligible, household members of those shielding and frontline social care workers. The second phase 
is planned to begin in December and will incorporate those aged 55 to 64 who aren't otherwise eligible. The COVID-19 pandemic has had an effect on every aspect of public health, including the vaccine supply at a global level. This means that the Scottish Government has had to take hard decisions about how we expand eligibility. The pandemic has also meant that situations can change hugely at very short notice. So we'll adapt our approach to any changes that occur throughout flu season, always prioritising those most at risk from seasonal flu, and always seeking to protect the NHS as far as possible. We are prioritising the existing cohorts, household members of those shielding and frontline social care workers, as we know these groups are either at the greatest risk of contracting seasonal flu or can act as a source of infection to those who are most vulnerable. And once uptake levels are known within those groups, we will review vaccine supplies to consider whether eligibility could be extended further. Getting the seasonal flu vaccine, especially when you have free eligibility, is one of the ways that individuals can contribute to supporting the NHS and protecting one another this winter. If you want to check whether you're eligible for the vaccine, please visit the NHS Inform website. And if you receive a letter inviting you to get a vaccine, please follow the instructions contained in it. Vaccination is one of the strongest defences we have against infectious disease. And this year, more than ever, I'm asking you to please take up the offer of receiving your flu vaccine if you're eligible. Many thanks, Rebecca. Um, can I go now straight to questions? Uh, firstly, today, Lindsay Buse from BBC. Thank you, First Minister. Um, can I ask, the Chancellor was in Scotland today and has said that he'll review borrowing arrangements. Um, I'm just wondering in the short term what more you think can be done on that. And on the issue of football, what's your understanding of what a sporting bubble should be, what a sporting bubble should look like? Uh, there seems to be a bit of confusion over this. And just lastly, you mentioned uh, statutory guidance for hospitality. Um, can you say anything about what the sanctions would be for those who don't follow that statutory guidance? Okay, thanks. I'll hand over to Fiona on uh, your question about the Chancellor. We have, uh, as you know, been arguing uh, for some time now for a significant increase and increased flexibility in the Scottish Government's borrowing powers to allow us to respond more flexibly than we are able to. I certainly welcome any comments that suggest uh, that the Chancellor is open to that and Kate Forbes and, and Fiona Hislop will continue to, to take that argument forward. But I'll ask Fiona to say a bit more about that in, in a second. Um, on sporting bubbles, let me the, the guidance is, is, is there and uh, anybody can go and, and see what the guidance is that was agreed after a lot of work uh, between the Scottish Government, the SFA and the SPFL. If there is uh, any uh, suggestion that that guidance needs clarified, we will listen to that and uh, take whatever action is appropriate. But can I just be very clear that when we're talking about what happened in Aberdeen, which is football players going uh, to a bar, I, I don't think there should be any jubiety about that. We are trying to protect uh, sporting bubbles, so footballers behaving in that way not only risk compromising the sporting bubbles that their, their clubs are trying to protect, but high-profile footballers in a city centre bar also pose, uh, I suppose, the, the risk of attracting crowds and, and uh, attracting other people. So, you know, in any way you want to look at this, and I, you know, I'm sorry to be blunt here, that was not responsible behaviour. Um, so let's just take this opportunity to underline the really important obligation that rests on football players, but also rests on clubs to make sure that the players know what the guidance is and are complying uh, with it. I think that is is really important. There was huge enthusiasm uh, because we know how important football is to the country to get competitive matches back again. Um, clubs wanted that, fans want that, players want that. Uh, I want that to continue. But if we don't have the guidance that underpins that agreement uh, being adhered to, then it is at risk. And, and I have to be blunt in saying that. Uh, so hopefully uh, this will be uh, a lesson that is learned uh, by everyone. Um, and on the issue of uh, the statutory guidance, we will publish obviously this next week, so I'm not going to go into the fine details of it. We are finalising uh, that right now. I want to give the indication of it today, um, but we will set out the details of it over the course of next week before it takes effect at the end of the week. The first of the 25 recommendations of the Independent Economic Advisory Group recommended a review of the fiscal arrangements uh, within the United Kingdom. And of course, we have accepted all of those recommendations and indeed have been calling for such uh, arrangements to be reviewed for some time. But the uh, 
the, the time scale of this is the issue. Uh, as of now, as of now, we need immediate support for our businesses, but also for our other services in dealing with COVID. So in Scotland, we have cross-party support uh, for the proposals that there should be more flexibility for borrowing within the devolution settlement to enable us to borrow £500 million more to help immediately now with the COVID response. And that is what we're appealing to the UK government to ensure that they can deliver. It's very frustrating when we know that there are such low rates of borrowing that we can't move quickly and swiftly this is unprecedented times. It needs that immediate response. Uh, Stephen Brown from STV. Um, good afternoon. Um, First Minister, it would appear that the Scottish Government has uh, taken the decision, albeit now uh, in agreement with the football authorities, to uh, postpone uh, the match. Are you disappointed that the football authorities initially didn't decide to come to that conclusion on their own? And Obviously, it will usually be for the football authorities to provide sanctions on clubs, but is there anything in the future that the government may look to do in terms of, of on football clubs acting as a business? Um, well, we always, not just in relation to football, in relation to all aspects of handling uh, this pandemic, we'll consider whether there's more that government can do. In terms of sanctions on clubs, that is for the football authorities, and I would encourage them to think about how... Uh, the, uh, how they approach that if we see a repeat of this situation, which I very much hope we don't. Uh, the decision to postpone tomorrow's match is one that uh, the football authorities have reached, but you know the government this morning made very clear uh, our view that the match uh, shouldn't go ahead because of the reasons that I set out. That you know while uh, certainly you know I've been assured that the risks of further transmission uh, within the club or from the club to others are very low, we're asking everybody to behave in a really precautionary manner right now and given that we know rules were breached and um, I don't think we can be a hundred percent sure there is no risk there and therefore to allow even if it is a tiny tiny risk the potential for the virus to be taken by the the club from Aberdeen to Perth it wouldn't be fair to the people of Perth so I don't think that is appropriate um, you know I I'm trying to be diplomatic here. I, I, I'm pretty furious about this situation because it shouldn't have happened. Uh, but on the upside, let's just take the opportunity to underline the importance of this. The, the decision to allow competitive sport, elite competitive sport, to, to, to get up and running again wasn't one we took lightly. There was lots of reasons why that uh, was something we, we were quite nervous about. But we got to a point of giving it the go ahead because a lot of work went into agreeing the guidance uh, that, that underpins it. So it was very much conditional on that. And if that guidance is not going to be adhered to, then you know, all bets are off. So let's hope this is a salutary lesson to everyone. Um, yeah, I should say, with the best will in the world, you know, there will be people who get this virus even if they've tried their very hardest to comply with all of the guidance, because that's that's the nature of a virus. So if this was a situation where a couple of football players had got it, you know, despite their best efforts to comply with everything, I would have nothing but sympathy for them. But this has been uh, because players went to a pub in Aberdeen on Saturday night, and that's not acceptable. And it's really important just to be clear about that right now so that we don't see a repeat of this kind of uh, incident. Uh, Lewis Mickey from uh, Bower, sorry. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Uh, this morning we've been speaking to Kate Smith from Aberdeen. She's now lost her job twice in the pandemic and the most recent being as a direct result of the new measures in Aberdeen. What kind of support will be available to people like Kate um, in terms of trying to either find a new job or in the in-between? Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Lewis, for that question. I'll, I'll hand over to Fiona in a second, uh, who want to add. Um, obviously, I, I don't know where Kate worked and I don't know what the nature of her job is. Uh, but as I said, uh, the day we regrettably announced the measures in Aberdeen, businesses who had staff in the furlough scheme, who had taken them out of the furlough scheme, have the option of putting them back in at the moment. Now, we obviously have a, a concern that in a couple of months that won't be an option, but that's uh, ongoing um, discussions. Uh, there are also uh, ways in which the Scottish Government is considering, not just in relation to Aberdeen, but in future, how we provide, in partnership with councils, greater support for people who have uh, find themselves in, in these positions. And obviously, the, the most important thing for all of us in, in trying to get our economy into recovery is to keep the virus under control, because Aberdeen is 
you know, showing us just now when the virus runs out of control again, it's very difficult to keep that economic recovery uh, moving forward. So we will continue to, to do that, to, to provide the, the best foundation and look at the support uh, we provide. We've, Fiona and I have uh, taken part, as we do every Friday morning, in our the subcommittee of the Scottish Cabinet that looks at the economy. Big focus this morning. Um, again, I don't know what age Kate is, but on uh, the job guarantee scheme that we're working on for young people uh, in particular. So people's jobs and livelihoods are absolutely the heart of all of our thinking right now. I said a few weeks ago, and it remains the view, health and jobs, these are the, the twin priorities of this government and will be for the foreseeable future. I obviously also don't know the individual circumstances um, of this case, but I would say that the uh, support that's available for people includes what's called PACE, which helps people through redundancies. Uh, if people find themselves in that situation, uh, they look in the Skills Development Scotland website, they'll find information. Uh, the PACE support for companies and individuals has now increasingly gone online because clearly that is the delivery of a lot of the support and advice. But the most important thing is to think about the future and whether there's opportunities to, to reskill or retrain. That's why the transition funding is going to be important. Our colleges are going back. Colleges will be at the heart of our economic response and there may be opportunities there that employers can support those that are being made redundant to get into that kind of activity. I would say to those that are immediately facing the, the, the circumstances that Aberdeen finds itself in, that they can, if they have previously furloughed staff, they can do that and continue to do that. So uh, it's really important that we try and have fair work through COVID and that is why we also have a fair work statement that has been uh, supported both by the STUC and the Institute of Directors to make sure that people that are finding themselves in adverse situations can continue to be supported. Thanks. Uh, Jack Foster from Global. Uh, good afternoon, First Minister. This morning, school pupils from across Scotland were protesting in Glasgow at what they say is a classist decision by the SQA downgrading exam marks uh, this week. It was noticeable um, that these were in the main kids from working class backgrounds and disadvantaged schools. Uh, and like so many, they're saying that they feel like they've been hit twice by the pandemic here, um, being punished for growing up in a poor area or being at a disadvantaged school. Many of them told me that they just feel like the government isn't taking their concerns seriously. And I know that you've already said that these pupils should appeal. Um, is that the government's last word on this? I mean, when are we going to see an acknowledgement really that something more is wrong here? I do take the young people's concerns seriously, very seriously, and, and we will listen and, and continue to pay attention to those views. We have, we have an education attainment gap in Scotland. We've had it for a long time. We are working very hard to overcome that. The system this year, while it, I understand that for the young people affected this year, it will feel very different, but the system that we've had to put in place because we couldn't have exams this year has not created that gap, um, and, and I think that's important to stress. Um, the, the appeal process here is very important because it is the part of this process that allows individual circumstances to be looked at. I was uh, just observing in some of the media this morning the A-level results in England. A similar system has been used there and uh, they had planned to have a much more restrictive appeal process than ours but they have decided to expand it um, a bit more. So this appeals process is really important. And, and I would say to young people, I, I know you will feel frustrated and you will feel that it is not fair that you have to go through that process, but we are in a unique situation this year. And that is why we've had to take this phased way of making sure that we have an exam uh, or a results uh, process that is credible, that has integrity, but also ensures f in fairness uh, for young people as well. And in terms of, the government will continue to listen. The uh, Deputy First Minister uh, will subject to the approval of Parliament, make a statement to Parliament about this uh, next week. And, and we want to get to the end of this process. And this is the important point. We're not at the end of this process yet. Um, and we want to get to the end of this process where, you know, as in every year, not every young person will be satisfied with the results they've got. That will be the case every year. It's more difficult this year because they haven't had an exam where they can get a sense of their own performance. But we want to get to a point that young people uh, feel, uh, even if they're disappointed in their results, that they haven't been treated unfairly. And that's what we remain, and I know the SQA remains focused on. Fraser Nicholl from Original 106. Thank you, First Minister. The current provisional date set out in the route map for the return of fans in a limited capacity to stadiums 
is the 14th of September. But do you think this situation with Aberdeen Football Club casts any doubt over that provisional date? And do you have a message specifically for footballers at Aberdeen and more widely in the Scottish game uh, that you'd like to send to them today? Well, look, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's take each step in the route map as it as it comes. I hope that we won't see a, a repeat of uh, what we've witnessed in Aberdeen over the last few days. And let's remember that fans are not to blame for this. Fans are not yet able to uh, go to football matches, so we, we can't hold fans responsible. So I don't want this, if at all possible, to get in the way of fans in good time and in due course uh, being able to return to, to watch and support their teams. My message to footballers is, you know, and obviously we're talking about Aberdeen here because, you know, the, the incident is around Aberdeen players, but I guess it's a message to footballers everywhere. You are in a privileged position, you're role models, you know, you earn your position as role models because of your talent and skill, uh, but it brings with it a responsibility. Um, and that responsibility at a time like this is even greater. Um, you know, you... Are, are people who are looked up to uh, by younger people and, and by people of all ages. So how you behave matters. Um, it matters in the immediate sense of not creating risks of a virus transmitting, but it matters in the sense of the, the message you send to others as well. So, you know, I'd just encourage footballers to, uh, to live up to that uh, place they have in society as people who are looked up to and, and considered to be role models. Um, but I also want to be clear that clubs have a responsibility too. Uh, clubs have a responsibility to make sure that their players know what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing and that their players are behaving responsibly. So um, I'd also send that message uh, pretty clearly to clubs as well. And I hope that, uh, you know, while I wish this hadn't happened with Aberdeen, hopefully the experience of it will perhaps minimise the risk of it happening with any other club at any point in the future. And, and we can stay on track to get football back to normal, uh, whatever normal is going to look like as quickly as possible. Uh, Gregor, do you want to add something just about the importance of of minimising these risks of transmission, particularly in hospitality? So, so the first thing I would want to say is, 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 is I guess I stand here today just, just feeling an utter sense of disappointment and disappointment that um, so many people, both within elite sport and within Scottish Government and the various public health agencies, worked so hard to try to make sure that there was a grounding for elite sport to be able to return. And, and, it, and it seems such a lost opportunity that, that so early on the, the, we're talking about our message, which is a very negative message rather than something which could be much more constructive and positive in terms of how we hope that the, the population will behave. Because make no bones about it at all, this virus has not gone away. If we do not take every opportunity to prevent chains of transmission from being established, it will roar back. And we've seen with what's happened in Aberdeen most recently, how quickly this virus can re-emerge and start to spread and uh, cause um, extended transmission across a community. Now, I would still be very hopeful that the measures that have been put in place in Aberdeen are going to control that, but I'm relying on people making sure that they take every opportunity to prevent any further spread. That's why the FACTS campaign is so important. That's why wearing face coverings where it's appropriate. That's why avoiding crowded places, making sure that we're cleaning our hands regularly, cleaning the surfaces around about us, making sure that we're keeping the two metre distance from each other and, 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 and self-isolating as soon as we have any symptoms. That's why every time I appear here, I go on about that, because if we don't do that, this virus is going to come back and it's going to spread very, very rapidly again. Uh, Tom Eden from PA. Good afternoon. Uh, just a very quick follow-up to Jack's question. Um, there's no doubt that the coronavirus didn't cause uh, the attainment gap, but do you regret approving a system this year with exams cancelled that doesn't seem to have fundamentally challenged or changed this inbuilt inequality in Scottish education? Uh, and on education, um, looking forward to schools reopening. Uh, a survey of teachers by the EIS found that only 18% think schools are currently safe to reopen, uh, suggesting there's an awful lot of work still to be done in the next few days, um, notwithstanding the possibly more than 120,000 appeals uh, in the next two weeks. Can I ask, therefore, why you task the Education Secretary rather than one of your other 20-plus ministers to deal with the Aberdeen outbreak? Uh Sorry, I'm standing here dealing with the Aberdeen uh, outbreak. I'm uh, extremely 
involved uh, directly in the Aberdeen outbreak. The Deputy First Minister, uh, John Swinney as Deputy First Minister, has overall responsibility in government for resilience issues, but um, the principal uh, responsibility in government for dealing with this uh, outbreak generally in Aberdeen or across the country is, is mine. Um, supported, of course, by all my uh, ministers. On the, the qu two, qu two important questions, one of the difficult things here in a, in a situation where we weren't able to have exams is that whatever alternative system had been put in place, um, I suspect there would have been controversy around that and concerns would have been raised, albeit if we had put another system in place, those concerns might have been different and coming from uh, different quarters. Um, so I, I, I desperately want to see us overcome the education attainment gap. Um, you know, I, I heard a, a consistent critic of my government on education, Keir Bloomer, uh, the other day, talk about how much work uh, the, the government was doing to try to, to overcome the attainment gap. Uh, but if we had tried to use a, a system uh, put in place for a pandemic to do that, you would be asking me right now if it was genuine. Um, and I come back to the point I made earlier on. If we had gone in one year from 65% of young people in um, the, the, the bottom 20% in, in deprivation terms of the country to 85% passing hires, I would probably all week have faced questions about how can that be right? You know, are, are we just fiddling the figures to make them look better? So we would have faced criticisms, whatever. Um, but my answer there, of course, is uh, the answer on the part of the process that is statistical. And if you're a young person, that means nothing to you. If you're a young person sitting at home right now um, or in George Square in, in Glasgow and you have results that are below what your teacher thought you should get, you are going to understandably feel very aggrieved. And if you think that that's because of the postcode you live in or the school you go to, that is going to be even uh, more pronounced. And I understand that. I absolutely understand that which is why this next part of the process is so important. And I would ask people, you know, young people, you're entitled to be angry, you're entitled to feel um, that this is not just, and, and the government will listen carefully to that, but please don't uh, lose sight of this next part of the process, because this is the part of the process that's not a statistical model. This is the part of the process that looks at your individual circumstances. And if you did really well in your prelim, but I've got a result that is lower than that, that gets looked at. If you've you know, done coursework that your teacher thinks is relevant. That is what is looked at. This is the bit of the process that is about looking at your individual circumstances. Um, now, there's always an importance to an appeal process, but this year it is even more important. And the SQA is expecting and resourced to deal with a much larger volume of appeals um, as a result of that. Uh, and lastly, on the question about teachers, um, in a sense, I'm not surprised uh, with the survey results that you've quoted at me. Teachers, um, like pupils, have been out of schools. Well, some teachers have been, of course, in, in schools uh, helping to, to, to look after children in, in hub arrangements. But schools haven't been operating as normal for you know almost five months now. Going back from next week for teachers and for young people and for parents, it is going to be anxious for many people. Um, I think it would be... A, completely incredible to suggest otherwise. So we have guidance in place that has been informed by the best scientific advice we've got, but we will continue to work with teachers, work with parents, work with young people to make sure we are building confidence um, as schools return. But the fundamental point here, and it is in a sense linked to the point about results, we need to get children's education back to some degree of normality as quickly as possible because young people are losing out because of this pandemic and the longer they are out of school the danger is they lose out more so let's focus on getting young people back safely to school and building the confidence of them their teachers and uh, parents as we go none of this is easy unfortunately but we all need to continue uh, to pull together uh, to, to get through this and my last comment before uh, moving on would just be to express my deep gratitude to teachers. I stand here every day and I talk about rightly our health and care workers but teachers uh, deserve our gratitude and, and respect for the job that they do all of the time uh, but I know teachers are parents um, as well they have families as well I know they will feel anxious and that's why we will do everything we can to uh, ease those fears and build uh, the confidence that you need as we go into the new school term. Uh, Christine Lavelle from The Sun. 
Thank you, First Minister. It was just following on from Stephen Brown's question about Aberdeen uh, FC. Are you saying that the Scottish Government ordered football authorities to cancel this weekend's game, or how was that decision arrived at? And just given the incubation period of this virus, is it possible that we could now see up to three of Aberdeen's fixtures being cancelled? I'm not going to speculate on future fixtures. There was a meeting this morning uh, involving uh, the sports minister uh, with the SFA and the SPFL and discussions were had. I wasn't um, personally uh, present at, at that meeting. The Scottish Government was very clear about our view and the authorities have taken the decision uh, to cancel uh, tomorrow's, or rather postpone uh, tomorrow's match. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate on these issues there will always be uh, arguments for and against. I've, I've seen on social media the argument that you know Aberdeen should have been made to play the match because you know it would have been a sanction to have them play it with a depleted squad. Uh, but my concern is not having this virus spread. And if there is even the merest chance that we're taking the virus from one part of Scotland to another, I don't want to do that. So none of this is easy. But you know if everybody just tries to abide by the rules, we wouldn't get into these positions. Um, you know, let's just all of us focus on. Uh, our individual responsibility here um, as well as then because whenever we have to take decisions like this it's because something has gone wrong along the way and that, none of us want to be in this position and we minimise the chances of it if everybody just plays by uh, the rules uh, of the game pardon the pun and focuses on the things we need to do to stop this virus spreading uh, Connor Matchett from the Scotsman Thank you, Minister. Um, I wanted to just quickly return to the uh, issue of the exam results, if, if I may. Um, I've got a letter here that's written from a uh, chair of a parents' forum at one of Edinburgh's um, most deprived schools, or schools in one of the most deprived areas, who says, and I quote, the Education Secretary at the start of the situation had a firm commitment insisting that no pupil would be disadvantaged. He has ultimately not kept his end of the bargain and has presided over a disaster. The Education Secretary should take full responsibility for this shambles, responsibility for the continued shackling to poverty of our young people, responsibility for unprecedented anxiety and upset, and resign. Now, given your comments earlier, at what point, say, if appeals show that many of the results given were wrong, will we see responsibility taken either by John Swinney or by Fiona Robertson at the SQA? Look, everybody is trying to deal with a difficult situation here of awarding results to young people when there's been no exams. And as I say, as I've said already today, whatever method of doing that had been chosen would have caused controversy and probably have left some people thinking that the process wasn't fair. That's the starting point for this. Nobody, uh, nobody uh, wanted or wished for to have a pandemic that created the starting point for this. Now, if we were at a point right now where I was saying the process is over, then I think the concerns that you've expressed to me there uh, would be even, you know, would be more legitimate because we'd be saying, well, you know, sort of like it or lump it, that is the end of the road. But because of the difficulties in this process, we have uh, made sure this year that there is an appeals process, a free appeals process for anybody whose teacher wants to put forward evidence for them to make sure everybody's individual circumstances um, are uh, looked at properly. And that is just as important a part of the process as the part of the process we've just gone through. And if we get a situation where lots of appeals are awarded, then it will show that that process uh, has worked as, as intended. So let's wait till we get to the end of that process and see what the, the situation is there. But, you know, don't... It's not... There will be... Uh, Questions asked, there will be debates to be had, there will be a reflection that government and SQA want to make about the the, the method used in the, the, the last part of the process. I'm not suggesting otherwise. Um, but don't just cast aside this next part of the process, because this is the part of the process that we always intended would be about ensuring that individual injustices could be identified and rectified. Um, there will also be a debate to be had I'm sure about, you know, whether it is exams or teacher assessments that are the best way of of deciding a young person's performance. You know, a question that I would say is important uh, overall, although young people understandably are focused on their own results in the immediate term. 
But if we've had for uh, several years a situation where exam results have led to a 65% pass rate amongst the 20% the most deprived, but teacher assessments lead to a suggested 85% pass rate, there is a legitimate debate in there as to, well, which is the, the best way of doing that in future? So I'm not shying away from these questions, but I'm asking people who want to pose these hard questions and have that debate, fine, but don't lose sight of this really important remaining part of this year's process, which is to allow individual uh, concerns to be properly examined and addressed. Uh, Derek Keeley from The Courier. Thank you, First Minister. Um, on the issue of exams, um, I want, I've seen some concern about when the outcomes of non-priority appeals will be received. And there's been some, some concern that, that maybe could stretch on for quite some time. Are you able to say when you expect these to be completed? And on the issue of it becoming mandatory for hospitality businesses to collect contact details, what should those businesses do if members of the public refuse to provide their details? Will, there be, will they be legally obligated to refuse service in that case? On the last part of the question, we'll set out the details of this next week and the obligation will be on uh, the businesses to collect details. That is what they are advised to do now, but I certainly anecdotally have heard you know, varied um, reports of some businesses doing that assiduously, some businesses not doing it at all, uh, and some businesses leaving it you know, as a sort of voluntary thing for, for customers. So this will mandate the collection um, of, that de of, of that information because it is so important we, we have it. Um, on the first part of your question, I set out the dates of the exam uh, appeals, uh, the appeals process yesterday. Um, so uh, the, if, if you're a young person uh, waiting for a university or college place, then your appeal should be in by the 14th of August. For everybody else, uh, I think I'm getting these dates right, it's the 21st of August and the results of the appeals will be sent to school at schools by the 4th of September. So it is a, a fairly tight time frame uh, for the SQA to process uh, and properly consider uh, what they expect to be a bigger number of appeals this year. Uh, Dan Sanderson from The Telegraph. Uh, thanks very much, First Minister. I'm um, just staying on the exam results. Um, a lot of the, the um, a lot of the teenagers who've been affected by this perhaps understandably don't have much faith in the SQA or the appeals process. So I was just wondering, would you consider um, a sort of automatic appeals process where everyone with their um, who's had their grade lowered would uh, have th have that looked at by someone, which would obviously shift the emphasis off um, the, the kids and, and the schools. Um, wouldn't that be a sensible way through this? Everybody, uh, every young person has the ability to talk to their teacher about putting in an appeal, and I would encourage everybody to do that. We, will, of course, will listen to any suggestions that are made, but I don't want to distract from that key point that we have an appeals process, the SQA are resourced to deal with a, a significantly increased number of appeals. We always expected that to be the case given the circumstances this year. So to any young person out there, you may still have questions, you may still have uh, anger you want to express, that's perfectly legitimate, but don't forget the opportunity that already exists uh, in discussion with your school to put forward any evidence that backs uh, an appeal. Let me also make a, another point, because I'm, I'm reminded, Dan, and I should say this is entirely legitimate for you to do, but you were asking me earlier on about the increase in the pass rate and suggesting that that, or even with moderation, um, suggested that there was something not credible about this year's exams. I don't agree with that, but it does remind me, just to make the point, that even with this system of moderation, the pass rate is up this year, and that includes for people in our more deprived from our more deprived communities so let's allow this next part of the process to take place because it is the part of the process that is about addressing the individual concerns that people understandably have uh, mark mclaughlin from the times good afternoon first minister um, the chancellor's in scotland today um, to highlight the two billion pounds worth of spending the uk government has done I mean, that's enough money to fund Police Scotland for two years and, and the, uh, the amount of a few months being spent. Um, your personal poll ratings are very high and Boris Johnson's are in the toilet. Do you think the Chancellor and the Prime Minister deserve a bit more credit for the spending and the work they've done in Scotland? Um, well, I'm not going to start talking about opinion poll ratings uh, of 
either myself or Boris Johnson MD else, that's not what these briefings are for. But anybody who has watched these briefings will have heard me consistently since, since day one give the UK government credit for the economic interventions that they have made. Uh, central uh, in that is the furlough scheme, which has been absolutely essential. Um, in avoiding an absolute cliff edge of redundancies over the course of, of this pandemic. So I've done it many times and I will do it again today. They hold the borrowing powers that the Scottish Government doesn't hold, which is why we do rely on them to, to do so much of this, although the Scottish Government has also committed uh, its own resources to aspects of the, the economic recovery plan. Um, and we'll continue to try to work constructively with the UK Government uh, to encourage the continuation of some of these schemes for as long as the situation uh, demands it. Do you want to add? Uh, just uh, to add that the issue of loan and debt will be something that we'll have to consider further. Uh, obviously, the ending of the furlough will have a bit of a cliff edge. We know that, uh, particularly in October. But uh, when we get to the first quarter of next year, uh, these loans are due uh, for repayment. Uh, there are many companies whose tax deferrals will be due. And it's really important, therefore, that in terms of business support, whether it's from ourselves or indeed from the UK government, that we anticipate and think ahead as to what that might mean. I think that the bounce back loans in particular have been very important. Of course, they didn't start um, at the outset. They, uh, that was one of the areas that we persuaded and uh, as with others, the UK government to consider 100% support in terms of backing of those loans in particular. So uh, we do recognise the role and the importance of what the UK government has provided. We have uh, gone beyond a lot of the support measures and importantly, uh, provided a very tailored and bespoke approach to our support. And we published information, for example, about the £185 million hardship funds that have helped save thousands of businesses and supported jobs as well. So everybody has a role to play, but it's not just about uh, anticipating and reflecting where we've been. It's, 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 making, uh, it's not anticipating where we might be, uh, we need to think about, and particularly for those companies, many, many of whom are now indebted. And we need to make sure that even an indebted companies have an opportunity to grow in the future. And that's the sort of discussion that I regularly have with the UK government. Michael Blackley from the Daily Mail. Thank you, First Minister. Good afternoon. Um, today, Sir Ian McMillan, who is a former Vice Chairman of the SQA, has called for an investigation by Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Education into the methodology used by the SQA for the exams process. Is, is that something that you would welcome happening in order to find, if there have been mistakes, to make sure that they haven't they won't be repeated if this system needs to be used again in future. I've not seen the comments you refer to, so I, I won't comment directly on them, but the, the Chief Inspector of Education, of course, would be free to do uh, any uh, examination or uh, review that they, they wanted to, and I, I certainly would uh, have no... Uh, no objection to that, and nor would it be appropriate for me to, to have any objection to something that they thought was, was necessary. Uh, Tom Martin from the Daily Express. Hi, thank you, First Minister. Again, just returning to the exams issue, um, the SQA has confirmed that private, uh, private firm um, Alpha Plus was involved in this um, regrading process. So why was it that... Um, you know, a, consult, a private company had more faith put in it than, than teachers. And secondly, um, Labour MP Ian Murray has claimed you're at risk of becoming known as uh, the grade snatcher, while the Lib Dems in the last hour or so have described your government as being uh, one of, be, of, of being great, uh, grade robbers. I just wonder what's your response to, to that? I don't have a, a response to the, the sort of political language there. It's for opposition politicians to choose their own language. I'm going to focus on the, the serious substance of the, the issue. Uh, and in terms of the SQA will set out and have set out how they went about the process, including uh, the support they had to do that. The, the, the key point I want to, to, to reiterate today is the importance of the final part of the process. We're all talking here and, you know, journalists are absolutely... Of course, entitled to ask these questions, I'm not uh, saying otherwise, but all these questions seem to feel as if they're predicated on this process being at an end. This process has always had this next stage, which is exactly about looking at the individual circumstances and rectifying any individual injustices. And, you know, as I say, uh, when that process is completed, we'll see where that takes us. And, you know, there will still be people who have 
uh, concerns about or who uh, disagree with the methodology that was used in the last part of the process, that's fine. That's a, a discussion to be had. But in debating and discussing this, let's not risk taking away young people's focus on this next important part of that process. Uh, Kenny McBride from Broadcast in Scotland. Did you and the Economy Secretary know that Benny Higgins regarded Friends of the Earth as ideological zealots who would wreck the economy when you put him in charge of planning the post-COVID recovery? And how do you respond to the likes of Commonweal and the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, who have argued that not only is this language really unhelpful, but that Higgins doesn't seem to understand what either green or well-being economics actually mean? And Finally, why was uh, the asset manager for Scotland's biggest private landlord your pick to plan this recovery rather than consulting with organisations like Commonweal, who have plenty of detailed, uh, costed, pro-environment and pro-wellbeing policies all set out already? Uh, look, whoever we uh, invite to do pieces of work for us, uh, we'll have some people saying they're the wrong people, um, and, and I'm afraid that's just the, the reality of it. We consult with a wide range of organisations. The last piece of work Benny Higgins did uh, for uh, the Scottish Government, of course, was the implementation report of the for the Scottish National Investment Bank, which uh, was actually grew out of a, a report from Commonweal uh, recommending a, a Scottish National Investment Bank, and they, you know, a lot of what they had to say in the process of that was was integral to to the development of that policy. So I, I think you know there's there's a, a bit of a negation of the point in in that practical and very real example. Um, you know, I'm going to speak for myself. I and I, I think if you read the the report uh, from the Economic Recovery Group, the central importance of a green recovery and the transition to net zero um, is vitally important. Um, and, you know, that's my view. And organisations like Friends of the Earth and environmental campaigners, they are very, very important in being uh, drivers of our thinking around these things, but also critical uh, voices when they feel they need to uh, support uh, government to go further. So I, I hugely value uh, that contribution and want to see it continue and strengthen. Um, Alistair Grant from the Herald is the last question. Uh, hi, First Minister. Thanks very much. Uh, just on the issue of hospitality venues, I appreciate you're saying that more information will be made available next week. But can you give any indication today as to what checks will be carried out to ensure venues comply with the rules? Uh, and will there be spot checks by police or officials or can we expect pubs, for example, that perhaps don't comply with the rules repeatedly to be closed down. Uh, in other words, how, how seriously will this be treated? Uh, and can I also ask, just, just linked to that issue, uh, just with the, the new kind of mask rules, the new mask regulations, just been reading the rules there, and it just seems, it seems odd that uh, there's new rules for, you know, people going into any building, room or other premises used for the retail sale or hire of goods or services, with the exception of restaurants, cafes, bars and pubs, uh, when... I think as a point you've made yourself, pubs are, are seen as a key risk factor in this area. Um, look, these are, we keep all of this under review, so I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll ask Gregor to comment on this from a probably a much more uh, expert perspective than me, but if you think about it logically, you go into a, a pub or a restaurant, you, you have to uncover your mouth in order to eat or drink, and therefore there are risks with constantly taking masks on and off that you you contaminate surfaces through touching your face too often. So that's one of the reasons why it's not, net, although on the face of it, you would think, well, a high risk environment surely should be wearing coverings there. That's one of the reasons why it's maybe not quite so straightforward. But we always keep those, uh, those considerations under review, as we're demonstrating today in uh, taking forward uh, further uh, enclosed spaces where we're going to make it mandatory. On the first part of your question, um, I always uh, give you 10 out of 10 for that. I know you've said you'll give us further details next week, but can you please, please give us the further details today? Um, I, I can't give, um, I'll give the further details next week because we are in the process of finalising the, uh, the, the statutory guidance that we will publish. So I don't want to get ahead of that. But your point about checks, I, I've specifically said in, my opening remarks that we will be liaising with Police Scotland, with environmental health officers about exactly how uh, enforcement will happen. And to, to address your question uh, directly about how seriously will this be taken, very seriously, because we're seeing right now, I've been warning about this for a while, but we're actually seeing it in, in practice now, the consequences of these uh, pieces of advice 
being flouted are very real because the virus spreads. Um, so we really need to make sure that people take all of this seriously and that there is the ability to enforce where necessary. Uh, Gregor, do you want to perhaps, uh, even if it involves correcting me on uh, the use of face coverings in pubs and restaurants? So what can we say about face coverings in restaurants? Well, can we start off by saying that, that the evidence and the experience, not only from around the world, but, but now in Scotland, unfortunately, all suggests uh, that actually venues such as cafes, such as restaurants, such as pubs, are higher risk environments. And the higher risk environments, partly because they're indoors, partly because people congregate there, there's lots of surfaces, people tend to linger for a long time, and there's lots of speech and sometimes lots of noise, so people project their voice much more as well. And anywhere where ventilation is poorer indoors means it's a higher risk environment. But of course, the reason that these places exist is also so that people can come together and they may be either eating or drinking, and that makes mask wearing a, a, a real practical and logistical difficulty, particularly if you're, you, know, you need to take it on and off um, on a frequent basis. So there's nothing to say that people can't choose to wear face coverings in those environments, particularly when they're moving around in those environments. But at this stage, mandating them is, is not something that um, I, I could say is, is something which we would are currently considering at all. However, again, I want to emphasise this. If people are going into these environments, I guess it's really important that people realise that they, there is a higher risk that's associated with them. So again, I go back to the point I made earlier, making sure that you're taking all the other mitigations that you can, that you're keeping the distance as much as possible, as close to two metres or above as you can possibly able, making sure you're washing your hands regularly, making sure you're, you're not involved in any queues where you're coming into contact with other people, making sure that, you know, if it's a crowded, noisy environment, that there's going to be a higher risk that's associated with that. If it were me walking into a place like that, I'd take one look and I'd turn around, because I would say that that was a place that I wouldn't want to be because of the risk that I would associate with that just now. It's about trying to limit your exposure as much as possible to reduce your chance of coming into contact with this virus again. Uh, thanks, Gregor, and uh, thanks to Fiona as well. That concludes the questions uh, for today. Uh, thanks to the journalists, uh, to Rachel for interpreting for us today, and thanks to you for joining us. Uh, we'll be back here again on Monday at the usual time of 12.15. In the meantime, can I please uh, appeal to you again to comply with the facts advice, because it is really, really, really important. So face coverings and enclosed spaces. Avoid crowded places. Clean your hands and hard surfaces regularly. Two metres distancing is the, the default rule and self-isolate and book a test if you have any of the symptoms of COVID. If we all stick rigidly to these things, then we have a chance of keeping this virus under control. So uh, thanks for joining us and I hope you all have a, a good weekend uh, or as good as possible under the current restrictions. Thank you.